everybody. I'm Dr. Sarah Wooten, and I am your host for Dog Care On Air. And in today's episode, I'm super excited because we have an amazing lady on with us, Dr. Jennifer Chatfield. Hello. Hey, Sarah. How are you? Oh, you know, I'm hanging out with my COVID hair and my pajama bottoms. So, but you are looking fly, girlfriend. Well, hmm. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, I had to prepare. We're talking today to the most important people on the face of the planet, like pet owners. I mean, and it's dog owners. <laughs> I mean, I had to get ready. Absolutely. It, that's what it's all about. So, hey, everybody. Thank you. I love you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. So let me tell you a little bit about who this lady is and why you want to listen to her. Dr. Chatfield, she is a staff veterinarian at 4J Conservation Center. She's also instructor for FEMA and Department of Homeland Security courses, and she's a regional commander for the National Disaster Med Medicine System team. Wow, that's a mouthful. That's why she's got those big guns, right? Mm. <laughs> so um, <laughs> she is a graduate veterinarian from Texas A&M and has pursued emergency medicine and zoo medicine throughout her whole career. She is, not, she is double boarded. This lady, she's boarded in zoo medicine and preventive medicine. So she's kind of a badass. She's owned <laughs> not one, but two emergency clinics. She's been the senior veterinarian at a zoo. She has had done field work in Madagascar and South America. And she's the chief strategy officer for Vet Candy, which you will learn more about in a little bit. I've taken some of her classes to become a USDA certified veterinarian and She's hilarious. She's got lots of information and she's entertaining. So uh, she's got a ton of information for pet owners like you. So Dr. Chatfield, thank you so much for being here today. I mean, holy smokes. I think I should just record that little intro. I'm going to have that played before I walk in. And that's my new walkout song. It's going to be that. That's incredible. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I'm super excited uh, to talk with everybody today about I mean, all kinds of stuff. You know, Sarah, when you and I start chatting about pets and issues, I mean, it, it really, we, we could go on and on and on because it's, uh, our, like we're, it's one of our favorite topics. Um, so so yeah. I'm excited. What do, you want, what do you want to talk about today, Dr. Wooten? Okay, well, let's, so I thought, I mean, there's so many things we can talk about, right? But I thought since some people are maybe new to this whole discussion of infectious disease, I thought we would drill it down to some basics, right? So sure. obviously talking about infectious disease is all the rage today um, okay. because everyone wants to talk about coronavirus. And if mm -hmm. we want to talk a little bit about that, we can. But I really want you to be giving pet owners information about something called zoonotic diseases. Okay. I would like to hear uh, what you have to say about reportable diseases. Okay. And, and lastly, something that I always noticed in private practice was dog owners, pet owners in general, had a really difficult time navigating the whole health certificate for travel with their pets. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so I think that I'd love to cover those topics and then whatever yeah. else, you know, kind of throws in as well. So Dr. Chatfield, what... Yes. It is zoonotic disease. Oh, besides being one of my favorite topics, uh, <clears throat> zoonotic diseases are diseases that um, animals and humans can both become infected with. So kind of the quick and dirty explanation that I give to uh, like my nephews <laughs> who are small is it means it's a disease that I can get, you can get, and our dog can get, and we could all share it. Um, so it's one of those diseases that's passed around. That's really gross. Yeah. It's super so, disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what are some common zoonotic diseases that dog owners should be aware of in the U.S. and Canada? Yeah, so, um, so oh, we're going to go all the way up to Canada. We, you mean we have listeners in Canada? What? This is an international show. I wasn't prepared. No one told me. <laughs> Dr. Wooten, this is incredible. Okay. So, uh, you know, it gets cold up there in Canada, um, which is interesting. So whenever you talk about different climates, different regions of the globe, um, let alone just, just different areas of North America, um, sometimes the infectious diseases or the zoonotic diseases that are present can change. But um, the good news, I mean, I guess you could call it good news. The good news is that a lot of them remain the same. 
especially when you talk about two countries adjacent to each other like Canada and the and, uh, United States and North America. So some really common ones um, that dog owners need to concern themselves with are uh, leptospirosis, for instance. Um, oh, influenza. We could talk for like six hours on influenza. As you know, it's one of my very favorite pathogens. Um, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to think. Gosh, parasites, roundworms, hookworms. Um, of course, there's always rabies. Um, rabies is a big problem. And then you can get into the kind of ectoparasite stuff, which like fleas, which I think people don't think about fleas anymore. It's like, it's kind of like cavities when you get older, you're like, uh, then I outgrow those, right? Like, haven't we, haven't we gotten rid of fleas? They're not an issue. No, they're still a huge issue. Um, ticks and ticks themselves, in addition to the diseases that they can transmit from animals to humans. And the tick may come in on your dog, but decide that you're a better, you more attractive place for, for him to find a home. And he can bring a disease to you that your dog never even knew about, right? That wildlife have. So <clears throat> you're right. In this day and age, with the coronavirus front and center, you know, um, SARS cor coronavirus too. I mean, for heaven's sakes, we have public health people who are now become like rock stars, right? I mean, I think Dr. Fauci was on like the Daily Show last week or something. He's incredible, right? Nerds galore. Um, and I love it. And I know you love it too. But uh, people are starting to wonder about contact with animals. Um, and I, I don't know about you there, because I know you're in Colorado. You guys got wild stuff there, don't you? Yes, we and, do. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. And I don't mean like just your kids. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Wooden, I mean like real wild stuff. Um, and so people are starting to wonder about living safely with animals, including pets. I mean, you heard those crazy stories about um, those heartbreaking situations um, overseas where um, there were reports that people were just giving up their pets because they were afraid of this disease. And my thought, as I'm sure maybe was yours, was really this one? This is the one that's doing it for you. <laughs> Because if you don't prevent a lot of these diseases in your pets, I mean, they're going to bring them into your home. And so the good news is that there's a whole lot of things that you can talk with your veterinarian about as far as preventing or at, a very, at the very minimum, decreasing the likelihood that your pet will become infected with one of these pathogens and be able to transfer it to you. Um, so that's the good news. That's the good news. So... Um, what is the latest and greatest on coronavirus and dogs? Anything? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the latest and greatest is at this time, nobody cringe. <laughs> right now, like all of our listeners cringe because they're tired of that caveat. <laughs> but the truth is that with an emerging pathogen, as this one is, right, one that's brand new, we've never seen it before in this species, us. <laughs> We're the species. We've never seen it before in humans. And so it's called emerging. Um, but with such an emerging pathogen, we don't make any statements like they're all or nothing right now. Because, yeah, I don't want to be wrong later. But I really, what I don't want to do is create a situation where you have a false sense of security or give you um, incorrect facts. And then you put yourself or your pet at risk. So at this time, there is uh, no evidence that dogs play a role in the transmission of SARS coronavirus 2, the virus that produces the, the disease COVID-19, to humans. So you don't need to really be worried about that. In fact, um, the more we find out about this disease, this virus, the more we realize it's basically just humans. <laughs> totally like, like we're giving it all to each other so it's this direct it's it's transmission it's what they call community transmission where we're sharing it all with each other um and so that's <clears throat> i guess like in dog land that's excellent news in human land it's a little bit mm, it's a little bit less than ideal right um but yeah so the latest is that your dog really really does not appear to pose any threat to you whatsoever what about us to our dogs Yes, thank you. That's the, the I was waiting. I was waiting. Oh, <laughs> um, it's a good thing we know each other, <laughs> Dr. Wooten. Um, so yeah, so humans do do apparently present some degree of threat of transmission to animals, 
And so there was a couple dogs overseas um, early on, right? Early on in the pandemic, they were in Hong Kong um, and uh, the dogs were positive, but some of them didn't have any symptoms. In fact, I think there was only one dog that had clinical signs that were consistent with potentially uh, a corona, uh, uh, novel coronavirus disease. Um, otherwise, the dogs were asymptomatic. Um, so, and then they were released from quarantine at the time that their, their owners were negative. There's also cats um, that have been positive. Now, the latest thing I saw actually were mink um, in um, mm, mm, Denmark, the Netherlands, over there. I think it was the Netherlands. Don't kill me on the internet if I have that wrong. It's, but it's over, right over there in Europe, little country. And they, and they farm mink. And apparently some mink, uh, they theorized the mink uh, got it from um, the caretakers at the farm and then potentially passed it around and that sort of thing. But that doesn't surprise me. Does that surprise you, Dr. Wooten, that mink? Heck, heck, heck no. Heck no. no. That's right. That's because you know that mink, their cousins, the ferret, and cats. <gasps> Do we get to say cats? You can say whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. Because you know that's how I roll. But, um, but cats, so cats, ferrets, mink, they, they have very similar respiratory cells um, to humans. And so something like this, going to, going to them, not like, okay, like in other news, you know, um, right. not, that, not that shocking. Um, but still, pets do not appear to pose any significant risk to humans. Humans should not be nuzzling their pets, um, kissing them in the face, cuddling with them when they're sick with any respiratory disease of any kind, especially COVID-19. I think that you would be a fabulous host on The View because I just think. <laughs> <laughs> so if this whole veterinary thing doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> just go on over there. Yeah. Go right. with Goldberg and say, I'm here. Let's talk about disease. Okay. Right. So let's, let's, we, we, we drilled it down on the thing that everybody's talking about. Let's like expand it back out again. Okay. And because I know that viewers who are watching this right now are, some of you are probably feeling like major germaphobes and just seeing germs everywhere you look. Um, yeah. So how can you, how can dog owners protect themselves against zoonotic diseases in general, yeah. but also not, you know, live in fear or in a bubble? Yeah. You, you shouldn't live in fear. Um, you sh if you're living in fear of your pet, um, then, then we should have a, a longer conversation um, because that, that, that definitely should not happen. Pet, pets should bring joy to our lives. Um, and they do to mine. Uh, they, they should be um, just, just wonderful components um, to, to our lives. That, that, that bond that we can share with them is, is so incredible and so unique. Um, so number one, uh, I'm going to give you a few tips, right? We're going to call these, um, what are we going to call them, Dr. Wood? Let's call them, let's call them Aunt Jen's tips for living safely with your pet. How about that? Your dog. Your Love dog. It. Okay. So Aunt Jen's tips. Number one, close your mouth. How about that? Uh, when you're petting your dog, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to lick your dog? No, I was just going to say, that's number two. Don't steal my thunder. Don't lick your dog. <laughs> and like the subtext to don't lick your dog to rule number two or tip number two is don't let your dog lick you in the liquor, right? Like having pets around your face, um, <clears throat> it is risky. It's risky. Uh, however, a lot of people do it. Okay, me, I see a kitten. How does everybody hold a kitten when they see one? Oh, right up here. Oh, it's so cute. It's so cute. Right. That's what we do. And they love it. They love it. But um, you really should try to avoid having animals up close to your face if you can. Um, not because they would necessarily um, intend to scratch your face, scratch your eyes out, stick something up your nose. They don't intend to do that, but they could make a mistake. Um, and so you, you could really injure yourself. Uh, so don't do that. Additionally, your mouth is usually open when your pets are up there. And again, I mean, they're just a dog. They don't know nothing. They could stick their tongue right in there. <laughs> and then what have you got? Um, whatever they just licked, let's not go down that path, right? Um, additionally, if you are infected with a respiratory illness or they are, 
Now you've got all the schmutz coming out your nose, their nose, your coughing and hacking that like little cloud like you remember on like P the peanuts cartoon pig pin had like that cloud that followed him i think of that when i see somebody who's like snarfly and snuffly i'm like oh they got like don't put them in your cloud okay and don't get in their cloud if your dog's coughing um love them like down like put them on the ground don't have them on the couch don't let them in the bed at night um when you're sick or they're sick so let's see, what do we have? We had close your mouth. Oh, and talk to your kids. Because if you've ever seen kids pet a dog, it's like this, right? That's how kids pet a dog, their mouth just hangs open. Fleas jump in, it's disgusting, right? Dogs like shake, stuff kind of, this is gross. Um, so anyhow, um, so close your mouth, don't lick them. Um, talk to your veterinarian, talk to your veterinarian. I'm gonna say another word that some listeners may find a little bit scary, maybe a little controversial. Are you ready, Dr. Wooten? Go for ready? it. Ready? Here it is. Vaccine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what I encourage every dog owner, every pet owner, every animal owner to do, find a veterinarian that you trust and have a conversation with them about preventive measures. There are incredible preventive measures that will allow you to live safely with the dog that you love for their lifetime. And one of those incredible measures is a vaccine. It's actually multiple vaccines and they're effective. Now, if you read the internet, you'll find out all kinds of stuff. I mean, all kinds of, it scares me. I start thinking, oh my gosh, wow, I shouldn't vaccinate my dog. Okay, stop, stop the madness. It is appropriate for owners to inquire about vaccines. It's appropriate for you to go armed with information to your veterinarian. I do that to my physician. Um, and if I don't trust the answers they're giving me, I get a new one because I don't need a best friend. I don't need like a cool kid to hang out with me. I need a veterinarian that I trust. I need a physician that I trust to take care of me. And so <clears throat> read, read what's available and then go talk to your veterinarian and find out what vaccines are appropriate for your pet. Because there's a lot of them that are very effective. Uh, if somebody wanted to read more about zoonotic diseases in dogs, is there a good online resource for people? Hmm, a good online resource for people, that's tricky. Um, so, it, so it depends. I mean, this is the age of the internet. Uh, there, it's not like, a, I mean, I don't want to date myself, but when I was growing up, we had the child craft encyclopedias on the shelf. Um, you know, those came out like once every 15 years, I think. So I, I don't mind people Googling zoonotic diseases in my dog. Um, I really like the online version of the Merck manual, not because it's put out by Merck. Um, I don't work for Merck. But because Merck has a version of their manual that's appropriate for owners, that's free online. And it's really well done. It's referenced. That's the thing. You want to look for things that have appropriate references cited. But they also have a veterinary, Merck veterinary manual, which I know you're familiar with, right, Dr. Wooten? You've seen that. I mean, the 1976 Merck veterinary manual that was appropriated <laughs> at the farm for from a veterinarian who used to come by there every so often, got me through vet school, okay? <laughs> um, and no, I'm not that old. Like, I don't know like who's out there thinking, but I'm not that old. But um, that was all I had because I didn't have money to buy the big fancy books. So the Merck Veterinary Manual can be very helpful, but you can also read it if you're an owner. There is nothing that says you have to be a veterinarian to read that stuff, nothing. So if you want help reading it, take it to your veterinarian. Ask them, ask them to explain it to you. If you have a veterinarian who cannot explain that stuff to you as an owner, I mean, maybe you should go down the street. Get a new I veterinarian. Love, I love that because, um, yeah, the, the knowledge should be universal. And I think yeah. a veterinarian should be there to help you understand what you're learning and kind of curate the information that you're, you're getting. Yep. So love that. That's my only job, frankly, like I, as a veterinarian and, and I talk with new grads, I talk with vet students about this all the time is like, what exactly do you think our role is? What is our role? I mean, what are we supposed to do? You'd be surprised how many vet students go, 
<laughs> their eyes get really big around. <laughs> and that's not really fair to ask them because they're, they're students, they're, they're, they're not veterinarians yet. But for veterinarians, <clears throat> I get all kinds of answers. And they're really complex and they're really, they put all this pressure on the veterinarian. I'm like, wow, whoa, no, thank you. All my role is, is to take what I know as a veterinarian and make, share that with the owners and make recommendations based on what I know about what we should do with their pet. Prevention, um, routine care, specific procedures, what to do when they're sick, what to look out for. Give all that information because we're all on the care team. And I'm supposed to provide that information so that owners can continue to live happily and healthy with the pets they love. It's pretty simple. I don't think it's like rocket science. Um, but, but that's, if your veterinarian's not doing that, I would encourage you to find another one because there's a ton of great veterinarians and not every veterinarian is right for every owner. So you should find one that, that works for you. Love that. That's awesome. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit. Here we go. So we talked about zoonotic disease, stuff yes. that you can share between humans and pets, right? Yes. So if somebody hears something about a reportable disease, oh, yeah. how is that different and what should dog owners know about that? Oh, pack your bags, get the heck out of dog. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you shouldn't panic. <laughs> Again, if you hear something about that, okay. I always say, if you hear something, I don't care if you're an owner, a veterinarian, or what have you, you should always like consider the source you're hearing it from. Okay, so if you're hearing it from the internet, maybe verify it other places on the internet. I don't know, but call your veterinarian. If you hear something that's crazy and it's a reportable disease. So what is a reportable disease then? I mean, that's what like everyone's gonna wanna know. Is coronavirus reportable? And if I tell you yes, everyone's gonna panic. And because they think, oh my gosh, that's a reportable disease. So reportable diseases are simply those diseases of significance that either have the potential to produce widespread disease and illness among animals or humans, or to have an impact on commercial agriculture or our economy. Okay, so there's a lot of those. And, and in fact, every state has a different list of reportable diseases. And every state ag department has a different list and every state health department has a different list. And so what that means is that if I as a veterinarian, if I diagnose a reportable disease, I have to report that. You see how like what I'm supposed to do is in the name of it, right? Rocket science, they don't let me do rocket science. So I have to report that to the state authorities. Not necessarily because they're going to come in and do something horrible, because they may not, but because they want to know, because there are implications potentially, right? So then they want to know that contact tracing that we're all hearing about now. So it could be, where has your dog been in the last 30 days? Where has your dog been the last two days? Where have you been? Who has been in your house? Those sorts of things, because they want to know where it came from because they wanna make sure that they alert folks, it's contained or they're on the lookout, et cetera. Um, so it is something to be aware of. Um, I don't think you should seek out inf infection with a, <laughs> with a reportable disease, but don't panic, right? The panicked brain is grossly ineffective. Talk to your veterinarian, find out what does this really mean? Cause it could mean nothing for you, right? Could mean nothing, so yeah. So in Colorado, one of our report, reportable diseases is basically bubonic plague, which is still a thing. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot yep. of it. So what are some other reportable diseases that um, people may run across in the United States or Canada? Yeah, or Canada. Uh, well, I can't speak to Canada. I'm not licensed in Canada. But there are some things that are some, what we call like, I, I would call like universally reportable so that when my friend um, interviewing me, Dr. Sarah Wooten, asked me a question like that, <laughs> I'm not truly prepared for, I can, I can give a good answer. Um, and so, for instance, rabies is a reportable disease. I, that shouldn't shock anybody uh, because of the significance of rabies. There's no, no treatment and no cure for rabies in any species, zero. Um, so you can understand why that would be of interest to health authorities. Rabies is also something that both animals and people can get. So in general, zoonotic diseases, 
that uh, either spread quickly or um, don't have effective therapies available are reportable, wh whether they find them in animals or people. So you have plague. Um, let's see. Uh, so in different states, leptospirosis will be reportable. Um, right, so that's a bacteria that you get from drinking um, dirty water or licking things you're not supposed to. Once again, Aunt Jen's tip number two, don't lick it. Um, it'll save you. Uh, and <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's other things. Um, Are bot flies still reportable or screw, screw? Screw worm. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's like sort of a disease, but not. And I'm so excited that you know about that living in like Colorado because um, it's too cold there. <laughs> I mean, they can make it there, but you know, here in Florida, the tropics of Florida, where everything grows well, we did have an outbreak of screw worm. Um, and so screw worm, for people who don't know, is super scary. Like, I think horror films maybe I'd be made about screw worm because it's actually a maggot that will eat live tissue. <laughs> think about that, folks. Yeah, it's disgusting. And so anyway, um, yeah, so screw worm is another one that's reportable. Tuberculosis, um, brucellosis. Uh, hmm, trying to think of anything else here. Um, rabies. Oh, CWD, um, uh, chronic wasting disease. That's a deer, um, an infection in deer. That's reportable. Mad cow, reportable. Uh, so yeah, but it's always changing. There, there's always some diseases getting on the list, some falling off depending on your state. Because once a disease is listed, that means money is tied to it. So we've got to investigate where it came from. We've got to investigate who has it, how'd they get it, um, where could they have spread it, that sort of things. And so um, states are, are careful to make sure that there's a need to classify something as reportable. So people shouldn't just be going around and investigating all of this. I mean, they can, but like when it comes down to it, follow Aunt Jen's tips. Yes. And then know that there are your veterinarian, especially if they're USDA accredited, know what to look for. And so if you see anything out of the ordinary, talk to your local veterinar veterinarian. Yeah. So um, if you see saying, if you see something, say something applies to, to dog owners <laughs> as well um, as people in the airport. Um, because if you, if you see something odd, if you're at the dog park and you see something odd, now look, I don't think you need to be informing on your neighbors, right? I'm not that person, right? Please don't you be that person either. But if you see something odd, number one, don't go to that dog park, okay? Um, and number two, maybe ask your veterinarian about it. You know, what I always find interesting is that, um, so when I do relief in practices, because I still work in practice, because um, I like pets, most especially Frenchies and Border Collies, but anyway, um, people will come in and they'll be there for their annual exam and they'll say, you know, about four months ago, I saw this and I wondered about it. So I made a note to ask you and I'm like, cause your phone don't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, you can call your veterinarian, even though it's not time for your shots, right? You can mm -hmm. call them anytime, mm -hmm. anytime. Um, in fact, some of us like that. We'd much rather you call us than sit at home, being anxious, panicking, not knowing what to do, because guess who else feels that anxiety? The pet. The pet. And the next thing you know, you're in my practice, and you're sure you're saying, I, I just, I'm just not sure why. I don't know why. I don't know why, but he's chewing up the sheetrock. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> you know, if you're anxious and you're bonded with your pet, they're anxious too. So call your veterinarian. Call your veterinarian. You can check out websites too. The CDC has a ton of great information for pet owners, um, all about uh, um, tips like, hey, don't get bit. Hmm you know, all the way down to, <laughs> to more technical and scientific things, you know, um, and, and especially they, they have some information about wildlife in your pets. And um, so that's a, a really, that's a good, reliable place to start. Awesome. Thanks. So you know, what? I got nothing. I'm ready. Oh, let's do it. Okay. So lastly, health certificates. Okay. Now I know mm -hmm. no one's traveling right now. So, but at some point we will start traveling again. And if you have traveled out of state or out of country with your dog, then you had to get one of these little pieces of paper from your veterinarian. Yes, they're expensive. Yes, they're a pain. Dr. Chatfield, why do we need these things? So I, so this gets like, yeah. And folks, listeners, 
Dr. Wooten is poking me because she knows this is a soapbox issue for me. <laughs> so just so you guys know, she came prepared, okay? So I'm gonna drag my box out and I'm gonna stand on it. So what's very interesting to me is how um, now we live in this global community. Um, and it is my nature as uh, anybody who knows me is already aware to bring everything back to kind of a One Health perspective on any topic. Because if you're talking about animals, you should be talking about people and you should be talking about the environment in which they live because all those things are tied together. And so <clears throat> we live in a global community. You can be anywhere in the world um, in 24 hours. You can be multiple places across the globe in 24 hours. In fact, diseases can become global pandemics in 24 hours, okay? The original SARS was a 24 hour, uh, I'm sorry, a global epidemic in 24 hours. All right, so you have to talk about that. And people get to move wherever they want, whenever they want, largely. And we're looking at that now, right, in the context of an emerging pathogen. I'm not sure why this pathogen merits all that um, investigation, because we got all kinds of other emerging pathogens, but this one seems to be special. I don't know if it's blonde or whatever. So <clears throat> if you travel with your pet, your pet cannot just cross those borders willy-nilly because we by and large acknowledge that animals can have diseases of interest. So if whenever you're traveling, you've got to get that little piece of paper. Um, it's, and it is, it's called a health certificate. It's, it's a certificate of health. Your pet is apparently healthy at this time and free from the diseases that the country you're traveling to or the state you're traveling to is interested in. And that can vary. And that's what can be kind of the headache for people. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's a headache. I love it because it's a system. Um, and I like systems and I like systems analysis. And so I used to do lots of import export of all different kinds of creatures. Um, I used to do lots of animal uh, transport, animal movement, this kind of thing. And it's, it's really not difficult or tricky unless you choose not to communicate. And there are so many things in life that are a whole lot easier if you communicate. <laughs> and so my recommendation to dog owners is if you want to take your dog with you before you're going to go, before you pack your bags, before you hear all this, like before, before you're going to leave, um, you should call. You can either call your veterinarian. You can look online at your destination. So. <clears throat> If Johnny Depp had just looked online at what Australia requires for dogs to come into their country, he wouldn't have found himself with a situation with a couple of little bitty doggies that had to stay on an airplane and get the heck out of Dodge. Okay, so call and find out. Because if you call me as a veterinarian, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pick up the phone, I'm gonna call that destination, I'm gonna say, what do y'all want? Sometimes it's just a statement from an accredited veterinarian saying, this animal comes from an area that hasn't seen X disease in 30 days, that has had no cases of this in 30 days, that is free from this disease, or they might require some testing. They might require an additional vaccine. And what they're doing is preventing your pet from picking up a disease and bringing a disease in. So it's not, it's not super difficult, um, but for some reason, people seem to have this anxiety about navigating it. Yeah, and there's always a way to bring your pet. There's always a way. You might not like the way, but <laughs> there's almost always a way. And humans get to do whatever they want, travel wherever they go. Um, and dogs actually have a lot of, a lot of liberty. Um, other animals that shall remain nameless on dog hair on air. <laughs> but other animals, <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can't move, move a lot of things without like 18 different tests. <laughs> Um, and so I think, I think it's very interesting, especially in this context, this timeline with COVID, when we're talking about wildlife born disease that people are concerned about animal transport. Really? Really? Some of the most tested and investigated creatures that move across borders of any kind are non-dog, non-cat, and non-human. So, yep. All right. So I put my soapbox up. So who can, who can give you a health certificate if you need Oh. Oh, not the internet, friends. No, no, no. So um, veterinarians who are uh, USDA accredited, which means that, um, so USDA is the federal entity that regulates 
um, animal movement, um, and kind of um, program diseases, diseases that affect our agricultural industry and therefore our economy. Um, so they're charged with that. So they accredit veterinarians, which means that a veterinarian has gone through some specific and additional training in order to um, sign that health certificate. And it's, we have to do continuing education specific to the types of health certificates that we sign. Some vets can only sign for dogs and cats. Some vets can only sign for um, dogs and cats and um, food animals or horses. And then some vets, like me, I don't discriminate. <laughs> I'm not prejudiced against any creature. <laughs> um, and so I'll see them all. And so I uh, maintain accreditation to write health certificates for any any creature that comes through, um, which uh, a lot of those things change. This is not something that um, is static. It's not like when I graduated from vet school a handful of years ago, not that long, but a handful. We're just going to go to a handful. It, there, there's been new things added, which means to maintain my status, I have to go and obtain that um, training and those um, certificates and designations in order to maintain my accredited status. So it's not a small thing, um, which is why sometimes you see that cost um, be a little higher than you might think it ought to be for just signing a piece of paper. There's a lot that goes into that signature um, from your veterinarian. Yeah, absolutely. When I was signing health certificates when I was practicing, because I've been retired for a couple of years now, um, depending on where you're going, it can take up to two months to kind of work through everything. And it yep. takes a lot of technician time and it takes mm -hmm. a lot of effort on the behalf of the veterinary office to get yep. you what you need. So start early, mm -hmm. start months before, talk yep. to your local veterinarian, call the place that you're going. And so Dr. Wooten, when you were in practice um, and dealing with that, because a lot of people travel to Colorado. I mean, that's a destination. Hasn't been my destination for a while, but it's a destination. <laughs> and so people travel. Um, did, you, did you prefer that the owners gather the information for you or did you prefer to gather it yourself? You know, we, um, I loved it when people came in prepared ahead of time because it yep. made my job and my technician's job so much yep. easier because you have to spend so much time kind of figuring out all the things. Sometimes animals need titers. Sometimes they need vaccines. Sometimes they need certain parasite control. And so if you can come in with all that information ahead of time, man, you are helping your vet out so much. Isn't that golden? And, and that's the thing. And so, and owners, so when, when I would say to owners, when I would gently inquire about <laughs> why maybe they didn't do any research, <laughs> before they came in and demanded a health certificate because they're leaving tomorrow. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when I would gently inquire, uh, what people were shocked. Owners would say, well, I, I didn't know I could do that. And, you know, I, in my head, I'd say, well, it's America. You could do anything you want, pretty much. Just don't hurt anybody. <laughs> um, and so uh, I love it when owners are informed and engaged because not only does it make my life easier, but uh, I'm sure you found this it means that they're really engaged in the health of their pet. And that makes my life so much easier on so many levels. Um, because I would so much rather them come in and say, hey, I read this, is this right? Is this true? Because I'm leaning that way. And I can say, ah, yeah, no, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Um, I love that. And so I really hope that your listeners, you guys out there, dog owners, you don't have to just show up and kind of, you know, wander and float around, <laughs> empower yourselves, be an informed dog owner. You, you will be surprised at how much your veterinarian will come to appreciate that. So yeah, so love it. I just thought I would ask you if it was kind of the same experience. I love it. For a second, you were interviewing me. Well, yeah. I mean, you've been in practice for a while. You were in practice for a long, you've seen and done a whole lot of things, Dr. Wooten. And I suspect your listeners may not be aware of all of those different things, <laughs> all those different hats. Uh, like you, it's been a handful of years, so we'll leave it at that. So my last question for you, are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. What the heck is vet candy? Oh, right, it was a subtle message with my backdrop that I wanted you guys to ask me about that candy. No, thank you so much. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so vet candy, so vet candy is re relatively new. It is a digital media hub. 
Um, and it's a, it's a, a company that was founded by a veterinarian um, who let, walked away from Fortune 500 company um, in industry um, and had done very, very well there. She'd been at several actually and done very well. And she had a dream to start a company, call it Vet Candy, um, and really be a positive force in the industry. Um, there's a lot of things going on, and and I'm not saying that you know you, we need to be Pollyanna, like don't misinterpret. Um, but by my nature, I'm an optimist, um, and <clears throat> I figure we can always sort it out one way or the other. Uh, might take a little work, might be a little messy, but as long as we close our mouths, don't lick it, and wash our hands. We should be safe <laughs> in general. That has served me well so far. Um, so, so when she reached out to me and said, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this side hustle," I said, "Yes." She said, well, I, um, "I haven't said what it is," and I'm like, "I don't care," uh, because she's a wonderful person to work with. And so we have a core team. Actually, my twin brother, who's also a veterinarian, is on our core team as well. I drug him into it, um, and and it's really a lot of fun. So. Uh, we have a website, myvetcandy.com, where there's all kinds of information. And even though it's vet candy, what we have learned is that um, we have a lot of pet owners um, and animal care professionals that um, you know frequent our site, read our stuff, listen to our shows. Um, we have uh, the number one podcast right now on Pet Life Radio. Um, it's hosted by myself and my brother. And we talk about all kinds of things. Um, sometimes we talk about my favorite diseases. Um, and, and sometimes we talk about other things. We just had a podcast of, um, with three rock stars, rock star veterinarians of the commercial ag industry, um, from the pork industry, the poultry industry. Um, we talked all about the food supply and coronavirus. Um, <clears throat> because I saw on the news, they would talk about it on the news, but then no one would talk about, okay, let's go a little deeper. What? Um, is it safe to eat meat? I don't even know. <laughs> no one would talk about it. So we did. So we did. And then there's lifestyle stuff. Um, so we have that. We just launched a new show. I won't even wait for you to ask me about it. I know you're going to ask me about it, but I want to talk about it because it's so fun. So it's called Vet Candy Pop. Um, and it's a talk show on our YouTube channel. And it's myself, um, Dr. Courtney Campbell, who some of your listeners may know. Um, and then Dr. Jason Chaffield, my brother. Uh, we talk about We talk about all kinds of topics. And then we, we, we interview expert guests too, which is a lot of fun. And it's, it's not just veterinary stuff. It's, it's things that can affect any animal lover. Um, so I, in this day and age, there is no person who should um, deprive themselves of information or um, investigation into topic areas just because it says vet or, or veterinary on it and they're not a vet. Um, knowledge isn't uh, something that should be hoarded. Um, the more informed all of us are, the better we're gonna be as pet owners um, and the better served our global community will be uh, because everything is connected to itself. We're seeing that right now. And for those who were not believers before, <laughs> I bet, I bet they are now. <laughs> so the more informed everyone is, the better off we'll all be. Um, so, so don't hesitate to take a look at myvetcandy.com. You can subscribe for our weekly newsletter. Um, you can try it out. If you don't like it, you can always unsubscribe. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and check out our shows. We've got a news show there, um, all kinds of stuff popping out. And there's a couple, there's a couple videos, Dr. Wooten, about very young, very thin, gosh, very attractive veterinarian talking all about COVID-19 and pets. <laughs> or at least maybe I can get you to believe that before, before you watch the video. But is it Evan Anton? Did you get Evan Anton or something? No, we did not. <laughs> we did not. We did not. I'm going to say I don't even know who that is. Dr. <laughs> no. No, um, but myself and my dog, Charlene, makes a guest appearance. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, definitely, I definitely want to check out um, your podcast, Pop, because you are so awesome. You are so entertaining oh. and so informative. You're so nice. It's on um, the My Vet Candy YouTube channel, correct? 
Yep. Yep. So we've got our YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and you put in vet candy, you ought to find it. You can subscribe to it and then you'll get notices when we push out new stuff. But, um, but again, it's not just for veterinarians. It is for all animal lovers. Um, you will, everyone will find something they like there, whether it's how to do yoga with your dog, um, or how to prevent disease in your dog. What shouldn't you feed your dog? What should veterinarians be looking for? Um, with diseases, with prevention. There's all kinds of stuff available. And the more members of the animal care team that we can get to be better informed, that, like I said, the better off we'll all be. And I can't thank you enough for reaching out to me uh, to come and share with your listeners. It's been incredible. Um, and I mean, you let me talk about some of my favorite topics. <laughs> so I will be, a, I'm a very happy girl right now. So I appreciate that. I love that so much. Well, thank you so much for your time. And thank you to everybody who's joined us uh, for this episode of Dog Care On Air. I am your host, Dr. Sarah Wooten, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks for checking out our content. If you'd like to see more, please visit our website at dogcareonair.com or any of our social media channels where we're uploading new content on a daily basis. Look for links in the description. And remember, dogs do so much for us. Learn to do the best for them.